We, the, the process of developing the story uh, and the idea for the show was first out of the gate, uh, get it right, and then we could focus on the casting, which was secondary. And um, But there was an interesting overlap between uh, uh, actors that we knew uh, within the production. So, for example, um, Kim Coates and Meet uh, were already friends or had familiar uh, connection to Chad and Mike, the producers uh, from Nomadic. So getting to them was fairly much, was more like a personal thing, which was just reaching out to a friend. And then for Vincent and Avon, we kind of had to go the traditional route where we approached their agents and uh, made an overture and um, made a nego did a negotiation. But certainly from the optics of needing a cast that sort of looked like, when you have a title like Ghost Wars, and you know the show isn't like the title, in a sense that it's you know there's more to it. We really wanted a cast that res that reflected what the show was in a way that the audience would go, oh, this show's called Ghost Wars, but Vincent D'Onofrio is in it, and Kim Coates, and Candice McClure, and uh, Kristen Lehman. It doesn't that doesn't compute. That's one of the things I was really happy about with getting the cast we did was it raised a question in people's minds like, well, this does may not be the show I think it is, which it isn't. That asks the question. <laughs> so, if it isn't a show, I think it is. What is it? Well, it's really, it's more, it's, I think it is in a way, it's probably, it is a bit of the show that you think it is, but it's so much more. We're trying to do a show really that's about um, how we all look at the world through our own lens of prejudice and bias and see what we want to see. And in a weird way, uh, the way we deal with the paranormal is also based on where we come from, what we think we know, what we've been taught. So you're looking at a group of characters who all have a different history, a different belief system, all trying to rationalize and come and sort of figure out what does this mean when it comes to life and death, when it comes to um, uh, the meaning of life and religion and life after death. So everyone's got a different perspective, which traditionally in a horror movie, you'll get a dose of that in a scene. But you don't get to run with it, as a sh and in a series, you can really make that the, dr the dramatic anchor point of the show. So we really do get to sort of mine why belief systems are the way they are and how they can actually uh, hinder and help in certain cases. How is the show with like the short seasons become very popular with the cable networks? Yeah. And like the condensing storyline. Yeah. Yeah, I actually find the opposite. I find that when you have a shortened season, it gives you more time in advance to build the volume of scripts up, so you can actually prepare better. So for me, ten or thirteen is a great, is perfect because it allows almost all the scripts to be written in advance. And on a bigger season like twenty six, it's almost impossible to do that. So you're really chasing the show. Uh, so personally, I like it. I think it's great because you can you can come into the show already knowing what the last episode is before you shoot the first episode, and that way you're backfilling clues and story points in episode one that you already know you're going to be shooting in episode 13 or 10, depending on the order. So for me, 10 or 13 is ideal. Yeah. So this looks a little bit different from your, uh, your previous show. Yeah. Like, is horror something that you wanted to get into? Well, I think I've always wanted to, I like all genre, you know, and Van Helsing was certainly uh, flirting with horror, so it wasn't completely new to me in the sense that Van Helsing was had horror DNA in it. But with Ghost Wars, it was certainly more an opportunity to go to more kind of traditional horror, which isn't visceral, it's more psychological. And I grew up in movies like The Changeling and The Shining and, you know, John Carpenter films, which were much more cerebral in their psychological horror impact than blood and guts and gore and shocking you, you know? And I personally like that better. So this for me was an opportunity to go into that psychological horror um, box and figure out how horror actually affects people's behavior and their psychology versus just cutting off arms and legs or having people bitten. Uh, so it's less relying on blood and more relying on what you're afraid of as an audience member and, and everybody, you know, kind of tapping into fears, basic fear, which is new for me, yeah. Three 
Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. I think that every branch of belief believes they have the answer. And so they isolate themselves naturally because they don't believe in the other branches of belief. And then, of course, there is a natural opportunity to have these uh, different belief systems bump into each other, but then also find common ground. So I don't want to sort of say that it's the only reason that the solve comes, or at least any solve comes, but it certainly helps when people get along. Yeah for whatever reason that is, whether it's fundamentally because science and religion and the paranormal overlap, great. But if it's not about that, you just also need people to sort of have a, a uh, an overall desire to win and work together. So both of those things kind of work, yeah. Hi. A show to watch with the lights on or lights off? Oh my God, that depends on who you are. I mean, I think it's fun with the lights on. It's got a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about what, like, why you decided to set it in Alaska and sort of how yeah. that plays into this? Story? Absolutely. It's a really important point because um, a town, the town, the story of the town had to really survive within the belief system that the town itself was cut off from the rest of the world. And so, the two things that work in the, in the favor of Alaska is geographically, you can drive 400 miles from the nearest town, big town, and find these isolated coastal towns on the uh, on the uh, edge of the uh, Bering Sea that are already designed to survive winters where they're totally cut off. So the idea of being cut off isn't new to them. They become tougher as a result. They become more self-reliant as, as a result. And the town is uh, already has kind of a pre-programmed system of survival. And for us, it was really important that the outside world didn't interfere with the story. And so we kind of blended into that and, and, and lent into that. Um, I, I really like the way that, that Simon wrote it. Um, uh, he's a Catholic priest, and he's in a, a small town that's been through a lot and, uh, and, and just in, in normal life before this kind of thing hits their town. And then when this, this event of ghosts hits their town, it affects them all in a very kind of uh, crazy way. And, and each person, each individual is affected in a different way. And, and the, the show at the same time gives you lots of scares and lots of gross outs and stuff. It examines uh, the psyche of everybody in the town, as, you know, the main characters anyway. And, um, that's the thing that attracted me the most. I wanted to make sure that when I read the first two of them only, I had conversations with Simon that that if I was getting it right, if, if it wasn't an accident that I was just reading it the wrong way, that what I'm reading is actually the point of the show. And, and, and it was, in fact, and convinced me that it was. And, and so that's why I came on board. And that's what attracted me. To and I came on board because I've done six two films, but... 15 of them, if you blink, you'll miss me. Uh, but when I read Gus, that was the best character for me that I've ever read. And I, I, I find that even shooting this character, I say to my wife, what we did that day, I say, this is the best character I've ever done. And I, I'm having a thrill. I, they only hired me for a certain amount of episodes, so it's a drag that I'm not in more. But I'm in jail. How many are you in? Seven. You only seven? Oh, seven. Can you talk a little bit about that dynamic between the two of you in the, in the show? It seems like you're both maybe an antagonist. Like not towards each other, but towards each other. We have some no, I, I think, I think, I think if they look more to Doug with Father Dan, yeah, there would be some real. He's very good in the show. Intense. There would be some real intense moments. But We've had a couple of scenes where he was a real fucking jerk off, and he's amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, Doug is a real. And he really, threat. honestly, I like no joking aside. He's, he's like him. When the camera's rolling, he is like, they are big time. It's really impressive. Well, me, your music was always really story-driven and really dramatic. Do you find that that's, uh, that sort of history with storytelling has helped you transition well, into an acting career? See, I, no, I started as an actor. I started early as a kid as an actor. Not professionally. 
I didn't, not professionally until I got into here on Broadway. And then I did Shakespeare's for Joe Papp. I did five Broadway shows. I did Rock and Horror. And we kept, and Lou Adler, who's the producer of Rock and Horror, told Jim Steinman, said, if you two don't make an album, you're out of your minds. Well, record companies just kept saying to, to me and to Steinman, you write musicals. You're an actor. You're like Ethel Merman. <laughs> and, and, and it took forever to get a record deal. And if it wasn't for, well, I call him Miami, but little Steven from the E Street Band, who this guy at this record company believed everything. He believed popcorn came from squirrels, if little Steven told him that. Told him that took the words. Yeah, yeah he's right. Um, that took the words was the best opening of any song in rock history. And on that, he signed me out. Yeah, wow. That's pretty cool. That's amazing. And I knew ten people that liked it. Took the it. words right out of my mouth. That's right. Great song. I knew, I knew ten people that liked it when it came out. What? Really? Took, I, never, I have never worked so hard. I saw him in concert. I've never I worked so hard in my entire life. Uh, I had to prove people wrong. You did. Oh, big time. Big time. I now have the third biggest selling record of all time. And now you do have a musical coming out, speaking of being the Echo oh, Merman. And, and, and it's a great musical, too. And I have executive producer title. Yes. Woo-hoo! <laughs> that means absolutely fucking nothing. But I do have a few points. So... At some point, I'll see somebody. What are you guys most excited about? What are you guys most excited about the audience seeing when the show comes out? I think, I think, I think it's the acting. I don't. I, I, I really believe that when you get somebody, I didn't even know he was in it. <laughs> and the first time you see Doug, I'm going, okay, I got to do something. Doug, I got to do something really weird. And I'm going, I know, the knock off from criminal intent. We used to sit like this at the table when you be interrogating people and go, so uh, you're telling me that. So I went, oh, I'm stealing from him. And so I did. And then I found out he was in the show. And I walked in and I said, you know, I'm stealing my first scene from him. He's a great actor. I mean, oh, good lord. <laughs> I, I, it's an honor. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not bullshit. It's an honor sitting next to you. <laughs> okay. It's bigger than Scott. I can Jesus. <laughs> and yours is harder than mine. Well, yeah, but I'm going to see a lot of ghosts. Later. Okay. I can say, like, without a doubt, uh, me and the ghosts are going to be communicating. Uh, I mean, frequently. yeah, you're in it with the ghosts, like, yes. in a big way. Yeah, I love them. I don't really. The spectral beings that they are? Uh, I, I come in a little bit later in the show, definitely as the voice of reason. Um, this is not my world at all. I don't buy into any of it. Um, and it takes, it takes me a long time to be convinced. Uh, and I have my own personal journey of just kind of scraping myself back, back to zero. Um, she's, yeah, we find her having lost her professional credibility, um, all her fame and fortune, and kind of taking this job because it's one of those jobs that like pays a lot of money but is soul destroying. But she figures it's a way to get back to where she needs to be. Getting something else. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you uh, happened upon Roman Mercer as the, you know, kind of like outsider that he's always been. Like he's... Uh, he sort of have a terrible life. Sort of a terrible life. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, I, I, I've obviously been moved up to Alaska. You're an orphan. Orphan. I have, a, I have uh, this, you know, I'm in, well, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been uh, left to my own devices. Nobody so likes you. No one likes me. Um, and I, well, you know. <laughs> it's true. Nobody likes me. true of life as well. <laughs> 
Oh dear, oh dear. Um, but yeah, I, I so I, I kind of inhabit the space of the outsider, and so as soon as this kind of uh, uh, fissure is created between these two worlds, and ghosts are appearing and uh, appearing real to the citizens of Port Moore, my uh, ability to see ghosts and to kind of like repel ghosts becomes kind of a hot commodity. And so I go from being an outsider to being kind of somebody who is um, uh, sought after in the town socially and being, being uh, I'm, a, I'm a layer of protection. And so... Um, you maybe have some conflicted feelings about that. I think I do. I think very yeah. seriously I, I do. I, you know, it's fair weather friends, right? Like everyone's your friend until like ghosts start breaking out. And, uh, <laughs> and everyone that's, wants you. Know, that's, that's kind of a true statement. Everyone is your friend until ghosts start breaking out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your friend right now, but if ghosts start breaking out, who knows? <laughs> All right. I, I have a question. Um, <laughs> this is going to be a little bit more in general, but... Okay. Uh, so there's like a billion and a half supernatural shows on TV right now. Are there? Why would horror fans choose Ghost Wars? What Just give it the, the, the most positive elements of why horror fans are going to like it. I would say that I think that uh, our um, writers uh, are aware of this uh, pitfall. And they're aware of uh, the amount that is available to people of fans of genre. They're also fans of the genre themselves. That's what I'm saying. They, they are like, like the guys. We they're are like, immersed in that. So they are looking for those. They're bored. They're as, they're as bored as everyone else. And so their whole thing is like, let's... Let's take this. Let's let's say let's go in a direction that you think is this, a very particular kind of genre. That this being the paranormal, and uh, let's not let that be the final stop on the train ride. Of but the also show. pay homage to it, you know. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's George Romero. Notable. It's it's yeah. all these things that you've seen. Alien. It's all these things you've seen, and all these kind of like concepts that you've seen that you're aware of, and they're done in a way that. Um, that if you're a fan of it, it's a homage, and if you don't, you're like, I've never even, what is this, fundamentally. And then oddly, little comedy. Tiny bit of comedy, right there, at the top of the brim, like a, mm, a, little, a little tiny patina. Like sea salt on yeah, a tiny bit of sea salt. <laughs> I would have gone cinnamon on like a latte, yeah, but go ahead, see ya. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks for playing. Thank you. See you Well, it was an idea that was brought to us by the network. It, it, it was uh, it, it incubated, cooked internally at Sci-Fi with Chris Regina and Josh and Justin. Um, we were looking at doing some sort of a, another follow-up to Van Helsing. And while we were shooting for a season, um, we were pitching some stuff that wasn't flying. And they pitched us something, and we were like, well, shit, we didn't know you wanted that. We didn't know you wanted a paranormal. So that's we took it, ran with it, hired... Simon Barry, who was in the, the room uh, with us on Van Helsing, uh, supporting Neil LeBute as number two, and you know he did Continuum and has done other shows as a showrunner. So it was uh, it was an easy, quick fix that we just loved. So it was a nice transition. Um, having done another genre series, Van Helsing, which was vampires and everything, I mean the network was looking for something that was ghost paranormal so you know it's fascinating it's something I think a lot of people can really relate to and it has to do with fear and ghosts so and you know just the whole setup of the show in Port Moore Alaska you know Alaska where the disenfranchise end up you know where there's always this landscape of colorful characters mixed in with the scientist element and all that stuff it was just a rich fodder for the you know the milieu and the character base for the show like mixing, you know, the religion and the science and, and bringing in the horror aspects as well. Well, it's, it's rich ground, um, and, you know, to have a central character in Vincent D'Onofrio, who's, who's Father Dan, and he's a, you know, he's had his challenges with his faith, you know, not always a lot of people have showed up uh, to church and all that stuff, and he's been a bit questioning. And then when these events start happening, uh, and, and you know, he's almost ill prepared for the for the. Uh, uh, we don't shy away from the religious aspect of it. We don't we don't we don't lean into it, but we don't shy away from it. So, you know, it's, he's an interesting character, and you know, that's about it. You don't lean or shy away from your religion. What about the science aspect? How is the science like your 
Yeah, well, you know, our uh, our writers are, I want to say, a bit geeky. You know, they they're not they don't shy away from uh, reading quantum physics and all that stuff. So I'm not saying we're like telling a story about quantum physics, but there there is there is a basis of science that's a, that's part of the show. If you ask someone if they believe in vampires, the answer is going to be probably no. But if you ask someone if they believe in ghosts, like, that could be, you know, just that you go around and get yes, no, yes, no. Uh, sort of absolutely. You, you, you guys missed it. You're not on, weren't into the, uh, the, the panel thing. You weren't in there. Well, Meatloaf said something that was so amazing. He said every single person in this fucking room believes in ghosts, or they've seen one, or they know it, or they're not, they're not really trusting themselves. I, I mean, listen, the good news is is everybody gets to have their own opinion. Much like down in America, you guys can all vote with a different opinion. Um, the, the thing about, the, the thing about uh, ghosts is, you know, it's a personal thing. You believe it, or you've seen it, or something paranormal has happened to you. I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I think that's the, the cool thing about Ghost Wars is we, we've made the, the ghosts... Um, or the situations very personable to each and every one of the characters. Like if you have a fear of, you know, a fear of dying, and you have a fear of flying, you have a fear of drowning or whatever, that kind of thing is personal to you, and I think that may, what, may help us distinguish ourselves different from other paranormal shows. The ghosts prey on your fears. And you're all thinking about it. Now you're scared. <laughs> now you're scared. What are you most excited for the audiences to experience when the show finally premieres? I think it's. Uh, I mean, we were very excited about about the show. Not just the scripts, the casting, the directors, the writers. It's it's the journey. It's come come to Port Moore, Alaska, with us for for a few hours and, and, and to go on this journey with you. I think I'm, I'm excited to see what the response is. Quite frankly. Um, we're hoping it's positive. So, but it's you know once we finish and wrap on August 31st, it's out of our hands. So, we've done our job and made a great show. We really believe in this this, this story, and this piece, and uh, you know the what's on the page and the cast and everything. It's just really come together. So we hope the audience feels the same. And if not, we got this space show that we're working on with Sci-Fi. Uh, no. <laughs> That's it, we're wrapped up. with ghosts in space. And sharks. And, and sharks. sharks. Yes. Absolutely. Well, you go through the shark asteroid belt. <laughs>I think what sets the uh, I think what sets Ghost Wars apart is that we're uh, very intentionally looking at what those other shows are doing and and sort of saying structurally we don't want to be that way story wise we don't want to be that way um, you know Ghost Wars is very much about ghosts it's not going to have werewolves showing up or vampires it's not going to be like you know True Blood or Bitten or you know um, Supernatural where you know you know they all sort of become, you know, like the X-Files was that way. It was like one week it's aliens, next week it's Bigfoot, you know, the next week after that it's, you know, the fluke man kind of thing. It was always like this, um, you know, sort of melting pot of paranormal genre. So for starters, we're staying in the ghost realm. And, you know, when you do that, you, you have to figure out how can you make each episode unique. You know, because it would be very easy for it to be like, oh, another ghost, we just do this. That's the Walking Dead kind of issue where, you know, seven seasons in, those guys know how to kill zombies, so it's not really a threat to them. So we, we had to we had to figure out we had to figure out how could the, the 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 zombies how could the ghosts stay a threat to the people at all times, and that made us realize that ghost stories are very personal, very intimate events. So. You know, structurally, it's kind of like a combination of a serialized show and an anthology series because each episode has a very unique individualized ghost story that gets sort of traveled through and completed. And those events feed into that character's attitude as they go forward through the bigger problem of the series, which is we got motherfucking ghosts. So. <laughs> What were some of the properties that you saw as a kid that really influenced you in terms of genre there? Oh, God. What didn't? I mean, um, 
you know, like I saw, uh, you know, I saw children shouldn't play with dead things when I was like six because my cousin showed it to me when he shouldn't have, and I was kind of hooked on horror movies from that point. Um, you know, a, a lot of the stuff from the 70s and 80s plays a big part just in general in my life. Like, um, you know, uh, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead is why I wrote Fido. Um, you know, uh, David Cronenberg's The Fly, like all the Cronenberg films. Um, uh, oh, God. You know, John Carpenter's movies, like, you know, Lu the, you know, Fulci, like the whole thing with the maggots in the trailer was a, was a Fulci moment for me. Like, I was like, let's do something with maggots and they just fall on somebody else. fucking gross. So, you know, and it was like, yeah, let's do it. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like, it's, there's a, you know, I, I've sort of developed a, you know, not just a love but a language of them over the years so it's kind of like this movie is a or this series is a uh you know it's a collection of all that sort of diverse imagery for me i heard from the other actors um but kim Coates is a really big presence yeah so yep. what was like having him um, as part of the show uh, kim's fantastic to work with he, he he was like you know when he came in uh, you know, he really brought a voice to Billy that even we hadn't thought about that character having. And, uh, you know, he's the kind of actor that wants to work with you to develop that voice. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I think because of that, he ends up getting, like, you know, as, as you saw in the, the trailer, he gets some, you know, just amazing moments because he's, he's sort of the... You know, in, in some ways, he's become the default human equation of the series and, and sort of, like, constantly feeling about... You know, there's this thing happening, but what's that mean for everybody in town? And in a lot of ways, he becomes the filter. When you're writing stories, how do you find that right blend between those like shocking, like scary moments versus just the actual story? Well, you know, it's it's kind of like, in, in a sense, it's 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 almost like we're trying to build to those moments. You know, because that's you know that's where we want the stories the stories to be living. So when we're breaking the story, we're very much you know in a way kind of you know trying to build to the scare because that's that's what we want you know the the, the, the series to be known for. So you know, I, I used to joke I joked at the beginning of the series, and I, I don't think Simon liked this, but I used to joke it was like writing porn, where it's like okay, so he walks in and he gets scared, and then she shows up, they scare the shit out of her, and then they show up. They get scared this way, and then we, uh, you know, end the episode. You said there's going to be different ghost stories throughout it. Or anything, you know, this is spark never made from a real-life experience? Um, none of the, I mean, there's been, there's been a, a couple of real-life experiences. There was a particular one when I was a kid where I'm pretty certain I saw a ghost while I was camping. Um, but in terms of the actual episodes themselves, they, they really uh, come more from who our character is and what kind of secret they have, you know, because that's one of the things that our ghosts like to do in the series is they like to draw out the things that you're trying to keep buried and hidden and use that against you. Sparking event that sort of unleashes all these ghosts. Is that part of the mystery that they're trying to solve, or is that just sort of, you know, you just leave it as a mystery, like no one's quite sure what happened or why there's sort of this, this attack? I think by the end of the season, everybody's got their own opinion about what happened, and that's, that's for me, what's so interesting about it is there isn't necessarily a, a right or wrong answer. Um, you know, for me, it's very much a horror series, and, and at the end of the day, the thing that makes horror work for me is the absence of explanation. So I've pushed very much, uh, whenever I'm in the room with Simon, to sort of stay away from something that we can lock on to as being like, this is what happened and why. Because when you sort of make the unknown known, you've, you've given it a quantification that allows you to fight it. And I, I always want there to be a, 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 a thing of, you know, you think you know the answer, but, but you kind of don't. And so as much as, you know, they think they're coming to a conclusion, I'm always, you know, undermining that. You know, sometimes without telling Simon that I've changed the line of dialogue. <laughs> so, and then he gets into pose. He's like, why the fuck are they saying that? I'm like, actor didn't want to say it on the day. We should just keep it scary. So. 
Has the casting influence how you approach writing the character voices at all? Uh, definitely. Definitely. When you're writing... I mean, one of the best things that happens when you're developing a show and writing is you find out who the cast is going to be because then those voices start to solidify, you know, and, and, and you know, Meatloaf is Doug is a great example of that. We knew, um, we knew we had Meatloaf pretty early in the, in the process, so we were able to sort of write his voice, like, from day one, you know, kind of right through. Uh, you know, some of the other uh, characters didn't get, you know, talent cast for them until closer to the, you know, the time that we started to shoot, and those voices were still a little... They were a little loosey goosey, right? And then once you start to see, you know, when you see Vincent D'Onofrio doing Father Dan, it's like, oh, that's what Father Dan sounds like. So now I have to go back in and change a lot of dialogue. You know, it's, it's, it's and it can be, you know, it can be as simple as, you know, this character should never ask a question, right? Like you want to go back in and make sure that character only talks in, like, you know, statements. Is there something about Vincent D'Onofrio that says he never asks the question? No, well, uh, it's actually uh, uh, Tim Coates' character is oh, really? that way. Yeah, whenever I whenever I do a pass on a script for Billy's voice, I take out anything that's that's a question because I, I don't want him asking questions. I want him I want him commenting. It's, it's 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 like you know because of who that character is, you know, you want him to almost be like the uh, the color commentator of, of you know of, of the show. I just want to ask real quick, when you went about making the mythology of the ghosts, like, mm -hmm. you know, how they work, what did you pull from, and why did you choose those sources? Um, you know, well, we went from, you know, everything from, uh, you know, personal stories, uh, what, you know, we remember from movies, what we've read in books. We had one writer in the room who was, you know, you know as Simon, Simon said, she's quite possibly a witch. Um, you know, that's how deep her interest goes in, in, in the paranormal and in, in, in uh, uh, Wicca. And, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of like we needed, we needed to construct a, a creature for our mythology that would be able to address those sort of four different quadrants of religion, magic, uh, skepticism, and... Uh, Oh, God, what's the fourth one now? I've been saying this all day and now I've forgotten it. Religion, magic, skepticism. Science. What's that? Science. Science, thank you. Yes, Landis's character, the one I can't remember. Don't tell Candace. Um, and and so, so it, it sort of became like a, a, you know, sort of a fusion of a lot of different things to, to create something that would run through all of those elements for us for the season. Shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what it's about. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you most excited for us to see when the show premieres? Um, the gore effects for you know are going to be awesome, so I'm excited about that. I think really though, it's it's the it's the fact that structurally, it's 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 the you know I'm really excited about the combination of anthology with serialized art because I've I've never seen that. I can't think of a show that was like that. And of course, now that I've said that, you'll all go, oh, it's this. Or, this kind of show. So. Are the anthology elements heavily dependent on guest stars? No, it's it's very much an ensemble cast. So you know characters, you know characters who seem like they're only maybe in in episode two as a supporting character, you'll discover in episode seven have a very big story. Uh, you know, and then by episode eleven, it's like that's their that's their special episode kind of thing. And with those serialized elements and the fact that you were able to write so many scripts before we started. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi. Is there anything we should be, that you can hint that we should be looking for in season one as a hint that of something we should be paying attention to that will pay off later? Oh, man. Um... Yeah, keep an eye on the bartender. The bartender? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, thanks so much. <laughs>